Good evening. I'm Henrietta Kotlis Rosenberg. I'm from Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City, where I'm Director of Pediatric Radiology. I'm also Professor of Radiology at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. I'm very happy to have the chance to speak with you this evening on GI emergencies in the pediatric age range. It is my pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you about GI emergencies in children. They vary according to the age of the patient, and it is extremely important to differentiate diseases that require medical care versus emergency surgery. We try to determine the exact etiology whenever possible. We often will have plain films of the abdomen as well, a supine, a left lateral decube, particularly to look for any evidence of intersusception, obstruction, free air. At times, we'll do a prone cross-table lateral view of the rectum to see if the air column actually extends to the rectum and what the caliper of this structure is. Uprights can be done in patients who are able to stand for the examination. And we always bear in mind that there may be referred pain from the chest and the hips, which can masquerade as an abdominal problem. So the learning objectives of this lecture are that when we're done, you should be able to list the wide gamut of causes of GI emergencies in pediatrics, describe the ultrasound appearance of pathological processes that result in abdominal pain, and describe when additional imaging is indicated. Let's start by talking about the acute abdomen in the premature infant. The most common acute abdominal problem in the preemies is necrotizing enterocolitis. The babies present with abdominal distension. They may have feeding intolerance. They may have increased residuals, heme positive or bloody stools. They may become apneic or acidotic. Their temperature may be unstable, and they may be lethargic. Necrotizing enterocolitis is a process that causes mucosal inflammation that extends throughout the bowel wall. The early detection of ischemic or necrotic bowel before perforation may reduce the morbidity and mortality. Neck occurs most often in the distal ileum or the proximal colon, and there is up to a 31% incidence of bowel perforation. Plain film findings in neck include distended bowel, pneumatosis intestinalis, which is intramural air, free air, separated bowel loops, which may be indicative of bowel wall thickening, edema or hyperemia, or free fluid. There may be gas in the portal venous system. There may also be bowel wall thinning in the presence of decreased blood flow to the bowel and ensuing necrosis. The typical film will have dilatation of the bowel, little tiny rounded lucencies that look like mottled lucencies indicative of pneumatosis intestinalis. The left lateral decubitus view is helpful to look for air that is free that may be dissecting between the liver and the diaphragm and along the paracolic gutta. Ultrasound can be used as well to show little dots of air within the wall of the bowel. Portal venous air can be seen on a plain film, and here we can see that there are also dots of air within the liver in this baby with necrotizing enterocolitis who has very heterogeneous fluid around the dome of the liver. Pneumoperitoneum is not always present in babies who have necrosis and perforation. It is an indication for surgery or other interventions. Here we can see that there is an air collection in the upper abdomen, which is not part of the gastrointestinal tract, the so-called football sign. In this baby, there is even more air on this follow-up exam, and we can see that there is outline of the falciform ligament and that there is air going all the way down into the scrotum, we can see the Rigler sign with air on both sides of the bowel wall. And here we can see on the left lateral decubitus view that there's air outlining the liver as well as the bowel. Here we have 
air that is actually outside the bowel on this ultrasound image that is consistent with pneumoperitoneum. Feingold et al. published an article in Radiology in 2005 where they talked about the assessment of bowel viability with color Doppler ultrasound in babies with necrotizing enterocolitis and demonstrated what the normal bowel would look like and the normal vascularity of the bowel. In babies with neck, there is hyperemia in the bowel, and that is an indication that the bowel is viable, and we can correlate that with the pulse Doppler waveforms as well. Some patients, though, develop particular appearances that are helpful in calling hypervascularity. This is the so-called Y appearance, where we see prominence of the distal mesenteric and subserosal vessels, and the zebra pattern, which is these multiple color Doppler lines indicating hyperemia in the valvuli conaventase. When there's no perfusion, we'll be able to see the distal mesenteric vessel, but no flow within this very thick bowel wall. With ischemia, the bowel can be quite thin, and with color Doppler as well as the pulse Doppler, we can check to see whether or not there is actually flow in the wall. And here's the ischemic bowel loop, which did not show any flow when that was insinated. The specimen that was demonstrated correlated with a perforation in the bowel as well as bowel that showed ischemic changes. And here's the perforation on the pathologic specimen. A recent baby that we had had extreme hyperemia in the bowel and also had an abscess in the left lower quadrant. They concluded that absent bowel wall perfusion at color Doppler ultrasound is more sensitive and specific than pneumoperitoneum on an x-ray for detection of necrotic bowel in neck and that bowel wall thinning was an important sign. So let's move on and talk a little bit about the acute abdomen in a full-term infant. The most common obstruction in a newborn is secondary to a congenital obstruction of the bowel. A little later on, strangulated inguinal hernias are an important cause of obstruction in the babies. And there are other babies who have gastric outlet obstruction due to hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Others will present with bilious vomiting who have malrotation and volvulus. There may be complications of a Meckel's diverticulum in the form of intersusception or bleeding. And then there are babies who come in with intermittent pain and vomiting and lethargy who have intersusception. Appendicitis is less common in the very young babies, what we always need to think about it when we don't have another cause for free fluid and the symptomatology. And then there are non-surgical causes of acute abdomen or what seems to be an acute abdomen in the presence of septicemia, gastroenteritis, and colic. I'd like to start at the upper part of the gastrointestinal tract by talking a little bit about the obstruction that can happen at the level of the esophagus. The most common type of esophageal atresia is that which has a distal tracheoesophageal fistula. Well, these are babies who usually come in with maternal polyhydramnios and excessive salivation. They may be choking, coughing, having cyanotic episodes after feeds, and develop pneumonitis and atelectasis associated with possible abdominal distension because of all the air that is coming through the tracheoesophageal fistula. So here we can see the end of the enteric tube at the distal esophageal, upper esophageal pouch, and there's a lot of gas throughout the gastrointestinal tract. In the baby who has no fistula, they usually have drooling associated with a scaphoid abdomen, and they may have other anomalies as well, and the case that I'm going to show you also had, in addition to an esophageal atresia, anal atresia, so that the baby did not have an anal opening. Well, ultrasound serves a very important purpose in terms of being able to assess what is going on 
in the abdomen, in the baby who obviously has no connection of the esophageal pouch to the remainder of the gastrointestinal tract. First, we need to determine the extent of the atresia. Most people are happy to just put a little air in through a tube. Some like to use a little contrast, and we can see this is a very high pouch. Well, the ultrasound showed all of the intra-abdominal organs and was very helpful in showing that yes, there was some fluid in the stomach, a little bit. We could see the pylorus and the descending duodenum, and then we could see the gastroesophageal junction. Could actually measure that it was quite small. It was a little bit over a centimeter here. And then the baby had some color Doppler images that confirmed that he has a little bit more fluid in the stomach. Baby went to the OR and an opening was made into the stomach and a trocar was put in so that it could be determined that there was a particular distance between the upper esophageal pouch and the distal pouch so that surgical planning could be accomplished. This was after the injection of contrast material. One can see how short that distal esophagus truly is. And this was the rectum on ultrasound showing that it was fluid filled and obstructed in this baby who also had imperforate anus. Here's another one who came in who didn't pass meconium and uh, the abdomen was quite distended. The gas that was present was displaced superiorly. Sonography done at the bedside to rule out what was thought clinically to possibly be an abdominal mass demonstrated multiple meconium-filled dilated bowel loops. The pancreas was somewhat echogenic and a little bit prominent, which raised the question of fibrous deposition. And then the baby had some little tiny stones within the gallbladder that weren't shadowing. There was also sludge that was dependent in the gallbladder. All of these findings are highly suspicious for meconium ileus in a patient with cystic fibrosis. The contrast enema showed that there was a very reduced caliber colon, and the contrast only went as far back as the appendix. The baby had a meconium ileus and an ileal atresia at surgery. Let's move on and talk a little bit about hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. We see this in males much more commonly than in females, a ratio of about four to five to one. These are healthy babies who present somewhere around two to six weeks of age. They're usually firstborn males. They present with non-bilious projectile vomiting, and they have a palpable olive in the right upper quadrant, which may be very difficult to actually feel because of the obstructed, dilated stomach, which is oriented in a rather horizontal position. Be aware that the pyloric channel should be quite narrow in a baby, and just as we look at the area of the um, duodeno-jejunal junction, we need to remember that it should be at the left of the spine, at the level of the duodenal bulb, at about the level of L1. And this is important to remember as we go on and talk about the babies with bilious vomiting. So there's the pyloric channel and there's the ligament of trites. Now, it used to be that we used barium to examine the stomach for pyloric stenosis. The stomach was usually over-distended. The babies could reflux, particularly with a tube down, and one would stand there for quite a while trying to see if any barium got through the pyloric channel. Not very easy in the presence of obstruction and unnecessary radiation. The typical appearance of the elongated pyloric channel was helpful when it could be demonstrated as well as the demonstration of the muscle shoulders from the thickened pyloric muscle against the duodenum. Unfortunately, with the barium, we couldn't really see the muscle itself. We were only looking at the channel. And then there was the beak sign and the pyloric tit sign that was used to help identify the area where the hypertrophied muscle was leaning against the lesser curvature and then the beak sign where the contrast was coming through the pyloric channel. Other causes of gastric outlet obstruction include pylorospasm, chronic granulomatous disease, peptic ulcer disease, prostaglandin-induced antral foveal hyperplasia, eosinophilic gastroenteritis, 
and Crohn's disease. One would think that a gas-filled structure would be difficult to identify and outline with ultrasound, but by using sugar water, it's possible to distend the stomach and see all of these little bubbles that outline actually the pylorus as well as the duodenum. Now the landmarks that we use to find the pylorus are the gallbladder, the gastric antrum, and the head of the pancreas. So here we have a normal looking pylorus, very slender muscle. We can see the mucosal folds in the long axis. The short axis view looks like a real skinny donut. And here we can see that there is some retained material in the stomach which flowed freely into the pylorus and then ultimately into the duodenum. By giving the baby water to drink, we have a much better chance of assessing whether or not the pylorus opens normally and whether or not there is elongation of the channel length and thickening of the wall. Here's a little bit of gas in the duodenum. So the long axis view, we will look at the length of the pylorus. The length should be greater than or equal to 1.4 centimeters to call pyloric stenosis. And we're looking for the hypoechoic muscle wall that is going to measure greater than or equal to four millimeters. Here we see it with ultrasound. There's some fluid and gas in the stomach. We see that there is elongation of the channel. It's two centimeters. Here's the gallbladder. This is the head of the pancreas. Now, remember that in very tiny babies, very young babies, they may not meet these criteria. So if you see that the pyloric channel does not open, or you think that you may have seen it open, just wait about 10 minutes and rescan the baby and just see whether or not it was spasm. Now the target sign is the short axis view. We're looking at the hypoechoic ring of hypertrophied muscle, and we're looking at the echogenic mucosa centrally. If we measure the entire donut, which we see here, it should measure greater than or equal to 1.5 centimeters in the presence of pyloric stenosis, but this is not one of the major criteria. In addition to the donut, we may see a little nipple that protrudes into the gastric antrum as the baby is uh, contracting the stomach. This is a baby who had clinical suspicion of pyloric stenosis, and the baby had a mound of tissue at the gastric antrum, which was not due to pyloric stenosis. The baby actually had a large ulcer crater. With duodenal obstruction, the babies usually present with bilious vomiting, and they may be babies with duodenal atresia, they may have stenosis, there could be a web, there may be annular pancreas. Plain films are usually quite sufficient to examine for duodenal atresia by seeing the double bubble sign of air in the stomach as well as the duodenum and the air fluid levels. Of course, it doesn't exclude additional atresias in the remainder of the gastrointestinal tract. With jejunal atresia, we'll have more than just two bubbles. And then we have to consider other conditions like malrotation, duplication cysts that might be causing duodenal obstruction or obstruction elsewhere in the gastrointestinal tract. Sometimes there's a hematoma, and at times there's preduodenal portal vein. Now, bilious vomiting is a dire emergency. I would not depend on ultrasound alone at this time, although work is being done in Chicago by Dr. Yusuf Sada to prove that ultrasound is sufficient to make the diagnosis. We do use barium to look for the malposition of the bowel. Now malrotation will manifest itself by showing that instead of the C loop coursing to the left of the spine at the level of the duodenal bulb, that it is somewhere more medial and inferior, and we see the same thing on this upper GI. The rotation and fixation of the bowel usually begins at six, the sixth week of gestational life. The bowel is growing so rapidly that there is insufficient room in the abdomen for the entire bowel. 
And so the bowel actually undergoes a counterclockwise rotation around the SMA so that it moves into the umbilical cord and the cranial limb is to the right and the caudal limb is to the left. Ultimately, the intestines return to the abdomen, the cecum returning last, and the bowel undergoes further counterclockwise rotation to a total of 270 degrees with the duodeno-jejunal junction to the left of the spine and the cecum in the right lower quadrant. When there is disordered rotation, the babies are much more at risk for valvulus. We can use ultrasound to evaluate the relationship of the superior mesenteric artery and vein, and we can also look for the whirlpool sign of valvulus. In the normal situation, the SMA, with a little bit of fat around it, is to the left, and the SMV is to the right, slightly more anteriorly. When there is inversion of the SMV in relationship to the SMA, we need to think about malrotation. And here we can see in this baby with a malrotation, this SMV is slightly to the left and anterior to the SMA. When the SMV is to the left of the SMA, it's been shown that there is malrotation in 100% of patients. When the SMV is anterior to the SMA, 72% are normal. And when the SMV is to the right of the SMA, 97% of the patients are normal with no evidence of malrotation. The whirlpool sign, as described by Shimanuki, is very helpful in terms of looking for the whirling and swirling of the blood in the SMV as it is around the SMA, which is central in the patient who has valvulus. Small bowel hematomas usually occur secondary to blunt trauma. They may be accidental, they may be non-accidental. Sometimes henoch sherline purpur is the underlying problem. There may be a bleeding diathesis, there may be leukemia. The most common site is at the fixed retroperitoneal portion of the duodenum, where the proximal jejunum is fixed by the ligament of trites. We may see circumferential wall thickening, we may see an extrinsic mass narrowing the lumen. Many facilities use CT to make the diagnosis, as we see here. There's also some free fluid in the abdomen. It makes very pretty pictures, but you can show exactly the same thing with the ultrasound and actually use it to show the regression without exposing the child to radiation or contrast material. Duplication cysts may present as an acute abdomen in babies who have vomiting and obstruction. They may have abdominal pain. They may present with hemorrhage due to peptic ulceration when the duplication contains gastric mucosa. Sometimes it's not easy to differentiate them from a mesenteric or a mental cyst. Colodocal cysts can be differentiated by showing the communication with the biliary ductal system. Pancreatic pseudocyst may be confused, abscess may, Meckel's diverticulum, and ovarian cyst. They are typically anechoic, although they may be hypoechoic or hyperechoic. They should demonstrate a muscular rim sign with the echogenic inner rim and the hypoechoic outer rim, the echogenic inner rim representing the mucosal surface and this is the hypoechoic muscular wall. They may have internal debris, hemorrhage, inspissated mucus. They may contain septations, at times solid components. There may be multiple unsuspected cysts. They may perforate, and over time, they may decrease in size. So if surgery is contemplated, repeat sonography should be done prior to the surgery to be sure that the cyst is still demonstrable. Here's an example of a baby who was a newborn, presented with bilious vomiting, had a study to look for malrotation. There was definitely an abnormally inferomedial position to the expected position of the ligament of trites, and there was a mass effect of this bowel loop in the left side of the abdomen. Ultrasound was done. There was a huge cystic mass occupying most of the abdomen going all the way down to the pelvis, butting the bladder, 
and we could see there was a hint of a muscular rim sign. The superior mesenteric vein was noted to be anterior to the superior mesenteric artery, and we can see in addition there was peristalsis within this cystic structure that extended all the way down to the pelvis. This is the bladder, and here's the uterus. And this was a huge jejunal duplication cyst. Now moving on to intersusception, this is a condition in which the bowel prolapses into a more caudal segment. It occurs in babies who are three months to two years of age most commonly. They present in almost all babies with paroxysmal abdominal pain. About two-thirds have a red currant jelly stool and up to two-thirds have a palpable abdominal mass. Intersusception is most often iliocolic and more than 90% have no pathologic lead point, but have enlarged lymphoid follicles in the terminal ileum. Those with lead points may be due to lymph nodes, maybe a Meckel's diverticulum, could have cystic fibrosis with inspistated stool, could be lymphoma, hematoma, maybe polyps, duplication cyst, and Hanuk-Sherline purpura. Sonography is the modality of choice for diagnosis of intersusception. First, we examine the pelvis with a curved probe. We're looking for a localized or a free fluid collection. We're looking for the intersusceptum invaginated into the incipients. And we're going to examine the entire course of the colon as well as all four quadrants using the linear probe and graded compression. This is an example of how we follow the colon around and look at the entire colon and rectum and then fill in the quadrants to be sure that we've seen every part of the abdomen because there could be an ileo-ileal intersusception or one even more proximally. We look for the pseudo-kidney sign, which is a result of the scanning plane in a patient who actually has an invagination of the bowel. Typically, we'll see a target or a donut sign due to the central donut that is due to the intersusceptum and the more peripheral donut due to the intersuscipians, the receiving bowel loop. Here's an example of the intersuscipians. This is the intersusceptum and this is the central dot representing the mucosa. This patient had free fluid. Here's the pseudo kidney sign. It's not the patient's kidney. Free fluid is not a contraindication to doing an attempt at a reduction. It's important to look for blood flow in the loops so that there is less chance of perforation. Many centers are using contrast material to reduce an intersusception. Here's an example of a patient who had multiple nodes in the right lower quadrant who had nodes inside the donut. And uh, here's the pseudo kidney sign and uh, this was uh, the lead point for the intersusception. If the child has profound shock, peritonitis, or perforation, they're going to go immediately to surgery from the ultrasound, and if not, we do a pneumatic reduction attempt. We use a technique where we don't use more than 120 millimeters of mercury, and we're looking to show that we can move the head of the intersusception all the way back into the region of the cecum and that we can show that there is air that actually courses from the ascending colon and cecum into the small bowel and finally this defect gets smaller and smaller until it finally pops back into the small bowel successfully reduced. When we see thickening of the bowel wall in a patient who has symptomatology of intersusception we need to be very concerned about lymphoma. There are some patients who come in with right lower quadrant pain where they have mesenteric adenitis, they may have acute appendicitis, they may have Crohn's disease. Mesenteric adenitis is one of the most common causes of acute abdominal pain in pediatrics. Plain film can be entirely normal, but we're looking for a cluster of nodes, and we're looking with color Doppler to show whether or not the nodes have flow in the hilum or if they're hypervascular. We don't find an inflamed appendix with mesenteric adenitis.
Acute appendicitis is the most common cause of the pediatric surgical abdomen in childhood between 6 and 12 years. The, if the patient presents with classic signs and symptoms, there is no need to image for confirmation. Ultrasound is a great modality in the right hands to make the diagnosis. We use graded compression of the maximum point of tenderness and pain. We start by examining the pelvis for fluid using a curved probe. And then we use a linear probe to examine for the appendix. If the patient is extremely obese or very large, we may use a curved 9-4 or 5-2. We identify the psoas muscle, the iliac vessels, and we try to find the cecum and look for the appendix arising from the cecum. The tip of the appendix in terms of its location is quite variable. We're looking for a tubular structure that terminates as a blind pouch. The inner part will represent the mucosal surface, and then there will be a hypoechoic wall that represents the muscle of the appendix. A normal appendix or an abnormal appendix, neither will demonstrate peristalsis. The maximum outer diameter of the appendix should be less than or equal to six millimeters, and the maximum thickness of the appendix, the appendix seal wall should be less than or equal to two millimeters. Sonographic criteria for acute appendicitis include a non-compressible appendix with an outer diameter of seven millimeters or more and a wall thickness of three millimeters or more. Color Doppler or power Doppler may show increased flow with uncomplicated appendicitis that is acute. Absence of flow raises the question of a perforated appendix. And if we see an abscess, but we don't see the appendix, we need to be concerned that there may have been appendicitis with perforation. We also look for appendicolis. Here's an eight-year-old who came in with right lower quadrant pain. We looked at the bladder. We then found there was no evidence of fluid. Then we found a blind ending tubular structure that was eight millimeters in cross-sectional diameter. There was some material within it. With compression, there was no significant change. This is the cross-sectional view, and here's the hyperemia. Another patient, here was the appendicolith, this dilated blind ending tubular structure that we couldn't compress and we can see the material in here, as well as the hypervascularity of the wall due to hyperemia. Another child with a two-day history of vomiting and right lower quadrant pain had fluid in the pelvis that appeared to be free. The appendix was non-compressible, filled with echogenic material, wide cross-sectional diameter of 1.2 centimeters, and hyperemia. Another patient had an abscess with an appendicolith that must have been extruded from a ruptured appendix. Be careful in girls because this could mimic a dermoid cyst. Another patient had extreme pain, fever, vomiting, white count, no bowel gas on the right side of the abdomen, had an abscess just below the liver, another above the bladder, and another one in the mid-abdomen. And this patient had three abscesses, could not find the appendix. Sometimes the appendix actually dips down into the pelvis and can be confused with acute um, PID. Um, it's important to assess whether you believe you're looking at the appendix or a fallopian tube. His hyperemia around this tubular structure that was right near the ovary, and we can see on this additional view that there's a blind ending tubular structure that has the hyperemic wall, and it turned out that this was the tip of the appendix demonstrated with endovaginal scanning. Another patient we couldn't find the appendix on, but there was a rounded heterogeneous mass behind the bladder. Using water in the rectum as a water enema, we could demonstrate clearly that this was an abscess, and in a boy, the first thing we'll think about is a ruptured appendix. At times, Acute appendicitis can present as a lead point for intersusception, as we see in this case. There are some pitfalls. Appendicitis can be confined to the tip, may be difficult to see. Retrocecal appendix can be obscured by gas. There may be perforation of the appendix, and we won't find it. If the appendix is filled with gas, we may not see it. And there could be spontaneous resolution. And then. Just a few words about inflammatory bowel disease. 
This is something that we may use ultrasound for very well to look for the bowel wall thickening as we see in this case. We can look for matted inflamed bowel loops, lymphadenopathy, abscess, the secondary hydronephrosis. And here's a case of a patient who presented with worsening pain with a history of Crohn's disease, a big dilated bowel loop, several bowel loops in the pelvis and the lower part of the right side of the abdomen. We could see that there is a change in caliper of this bowel loop as it gets towards this very thickened bowel loop. The content of the dilated portion is analogous to what we see on CT with a small bowel feces sign. There was also a little rounded structure that was contiguous with this long strictured area of bowel that on CT, as I'll show you, turned out to be a little abscess. We could also see the creeping fat and the hypervascularity with the ultrasound. And here we see the dilated loop in the pelvis. We see it extending toward the right lower quadrant to this long strictured distal terminal ilium and the small abscess. Remember too that there can be referred pain to the abdomen that can present as an acute abdomen from pneumonia, from acute chest syndrome in patients with sickle cell disease, could be referred pain from the spine, may be referred pain from hip disease such as leg perthes disease, and may also be due at, to an abdominal problem as simple as constipation. So in summary, we discussed a wide gamut of causes of GI emergencies in pediatrics. We described the ultrasound appearance of pathological processes that result in abdominal pain and discussed when additional imaging is indicated. So thank you very much, and I hope this information will be useful to you.